Good morning, Monroe County. Since everyone else went off script, allow me just a moment. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Crystal Turner Childs, would you please stand? <laughs> Lieutenant, <laughs> Lieutenant Crystal Turner Childs is the Deputy Commissioner for Pennsylvania State Police. And she is retiring today on Martin Luther King Day after 25 years of service to our community. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel. We love you and we honor you. Now, hope I don't pop too many peas in this microphone. Okay. It is truly an honor and pleasure to be with you this morning. I would like to thank East Stroudsburg University, President Long, the administration, students, faculty, trustees, Ms. Laisha Fleming, the ESU Center for Multicultural Affairs, and the MLK Celebration Committee for the honor of standing before you. Whether or not you will think it is an honor to be sitting in front of me, we will shortly find out. I am fairly soft-spoken, so if you can't hear me, just let me know and I'll speak up. I also want to send a quick shout out and sincere love to my millennial and Gen Z brothers and sisters, which I jokingly refer to as Gen Z gang, <laughs> because they know how to come together. The beauty of these new generations is that they recognize a better America is their responsibility and are willing to sacrifice to make it so. We saw responses to the state of America that differ depending upon the generation you belong to. Many of our beloved boomers said, ho, ho, hey, let's slow down. We like things just the way they are. My Generation X, the best generation ever, <laughs> they said, we should do something about this, but progress takes time. Meanwhile, the millennials and the Gen Z gang, they were like, we should do something about this. What time are we headed over there? <laughs> now that's the energy we need. Before I begin, I have a few minor requests. We are all family in this room, so I'm going to ask you to put your fancy titles aside so that we are all just average citizens of Monroe and Pike counties, and let's just talk for a few minutes. Is that okay? All right. This family meeting is officially called to order. We get together annually to enjoy a fantastic breakfast on this day and celebrate Dr. Martin, excuse me, Dr. Martin Luther King's memory that lives on in part through our deserving honorees and congratulations to the honorees and the award recipients. But I'm asking that this year we honor Dr. King's life, his fight, his bruises, his belittling, his family, and his death by walking the walk for all of us. Dr. King said, one of the great tragedies of life is that men seldom bridge the gulf between practice and profession, between doing and saying. So with that in mind, can we please agree to not do the MLK post or quote on social media and then turn around and do or say something in complete opposition to what you just posted or quoted today. <laughs> 60 years later, we march on for better days because someone should do something about this. We amend Dr. King's life and message to fit our comfort zone, but today I want to stretch you a little. We don't like to talk about the fact that he went to jail 29 times for things that included driving 30 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour zone. We don't like to talk about the burning crosses in his front yard by domestic terrorists. We don't like to talk about the shotguns that were fired into his home. We don't like to talk about his home being bombed. We don't like to talk about death threats he received on his home phone. He was indicted for violating an anti-boycott law during the historic Montgomery bus boycott. He applied for a gun permit so security men could guard his home but was denied. 
Dr. King was openly mocked, spat upon, and ridiculed by the lowest hanging fruit simply because he dared to demand the respect and treatment worthy of any man. Incredibly, most Americans did not approve of his life's work and instead called him the problem. A 1966 Gallup poll found that almost two-thirds of Americans had an unfavorable opinion of Dr. King. He began to lose popularity as he moved his attention from civil rights in the South to the North, with work starting in places like Chicago to tackle segregation and poverty among black Americans being met with ridicule and scorn. Even in the immediate aftermath of his death, many Americans still held a negative view of Dr. King. Nearly 31% of Americans say he brought his 1968 assassination upon himself. What does this tell us? Activism and civil disobedience can be very dangerous for those brave enough to speak out and challenge the status quo. Relentless and persistent activism like Dr. King's makes us uncomfortable because it forces us to look at what we'd rather avoid, especially within ourselves. But what you hear in that activism is undeniable truth, and we cannot and should not ever be asked to live a lie. It also tells us that many more had the opportunity to step up and align themselves with King's message, pledging to do their part to make the world around them better for not just themselves, but others they may never meet. In the end, we will not remember the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. So I wanna ask you, are you a good neighbor? Not just to the folks who live on either side of you, I'm talking about these neighbors, the folks who inhabit every corner of Monroe and Pike counties we call home. I'm talking about caring for the well-being for every mother, every father, every daughter, every son, the men, women, and children who live from the West End to Toby Hanna, whether it's an apartment, a condo, a trailer, a house sitting on two acres with a well-manicured lawn, or a homeless shelter. I'm talking about the people who prepare our meals and those who are serving us right now. I'm talking about the cashier at Wawa. I'm talking about the people who make our lives easier each day and yet we barely focus on their faces. The average cost of living in Pennsylvania is $45,000 and the average income in Monroe County is $33,000. 12% of us are in poverty. That means at least 25,000 of us are one paycheck away from homelessness. Someone should do something about that. Can we say we are truly good neighbors? Do we show up for others when it's most difficult to do so? If you saw someone breaking into your neighbor's home, would you not alert them and notify the proper authorities? When local, organizations, when local organizations like United Way ask for donations to support the most vulnerable, do you give or do you wait for someone else to do it? When you hear an inappropriate joke or comment, do you immediately shut it down or do you wait for someone else to do it? When you are frustrated by what you see around you, do you exercise your precious right to vote or do you wait for someone else to do it? Dr. King challenged us to be the best versions of ourselves for the good of America and each other, as any good neighbor would. So many of us rise to that challenge, and we are thankful for every good neighbor in our community who selflessly give of themselves for the greater good. Let me take a moment now to introduce you to some good neighbors. Will the members of Monroe County NAACP please stand wherever you are? Thank you for your membership and thank you to our executive committee for your service. Let me take this moment now for a shameful plug and say I hope to see many of you joining us for our third annual Black History Month prayer luncheon on Saturday, February 25th. And here's what's key. It's not just about folks making room at their tables for us, but it's about them wanting to sit at our table as well. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America 
and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us remember our individual pledge to deliver liberty and justice for all, not just the folks we like and not just the folks who look like us. Let's be willing to extend a hand of help. Extend your understanding to the unique but beautiful differences we all contribute to our great Poconos melting pot. But most of all, extend your empathy, because there, but for the grace of God. Someone will inevitably ask, what does this so-called justice look like? Racial justice looks like full accountability for the past and commitment to dismantling existing systems that were designed to disadvantage. Economic justice looks like a concrete plan to address the financial imbalance that adversely affects the working poor and middle class. Social justice looks like affordable housing across Monroe and Pike counties with a living wage and true work-life balance so families could begin to recognize one another again. It also looks like equitable distribution of educational resources and treatment to make all students feel valued and safe, both mentally and physically. Dr. King said, the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Education must enable one to sift and weigh evidence, to discern the true from the false, the real from the unreal, and the facts from fiction. With that in mind, how can we raise our right hands in courtrooms and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in front of God for witness testimony? but we're afraid to do it in our classrooms. Someone should do something about that. In 2011, researchers at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health found that poverty, low levels of education, poor social support, and other social factors contribute to about as many deaths in the United States as such familiar causes as heart attacks, strokes, and lung cancer. 60 years later, let's agree to stop arguing about CRT and instead put our focus, focus on adversity, diversity, and poverty. Five years before Dr. King, I have a dream speech, he was stabbed in the chest by a black woman during a book signing. The tip of the knife stopped at the edge of his aorta, and the doctors told him had it been punctured, he would have drowned in his own blood. The New York Times reported the stabbing and said if Dr. King had merely sneezed, he would have surely died. He received letters and telegrams from all over the world, but just one letter mattered the most to him. It came from a little girl that read, Dear Dr. King, I am a ninth grade student at the White Plains High School. While it should not matter, I would like to mention that I am a white girl. I read in the paper of your misfortune and of your suffering. I read that if you had sneezed, you would have died. I'm simply writing to say, I am so happy you didn't sneeze. She's a good neighbor. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, especially the Pocono mountainside. Let freedom ring. There were those who will always ask, it's been 60 years and look at the progress we've made. When will you be satisfied? Who would be satisfied with all there is left to do? Who would be satisfied when we know inequality is still accepted everywhere? Who would be satisfied when we have overwhelming poverty in Monroe County? I would like to gently remind our neighbors in public office that more than half of our students receiving public education live with some level of food insecurity despite their parents working two or three jobs. Work affords dignity and so should their paycheck. Someone should do something about that. <laughs> Who
Who would be satisfied to know that our youngest and most vulnerable in, K, in grades K through eight are often overlooked when considering trauma-informed care versus the current discipline response and behavior system? Who would be satisfied when no tolerance policies apply to fifth graders, babies, who haven't yet fully developed emotionally and as a result quickly slide down the school to prison pipeline? But we are asked to tolerate full grown adults who spew disgusting and hateful language at others every day. A 2021 Pennsylvania bipartisan task force has found that Pennsylvania locks up far too many first time and low level youth offenders. Black students make up 13.6% of Pennsylvania student population, but received almost half of the out of school suspensions. The law of numbers will outright reject anyone's impulse to accept that statistic. Someone should do something about that. Racism and anti-Semitism, disguised as or wrapped in the First Amendment, is as cowardly as they come. We dream of legislators to have the courage to create a law in our commonwealth for racial harassment, bringing a swift end to the comfortable but inappropriate place where repeat offenders pretend not to know better. Someone should do something about that. Who can be satisfied with the discrimination against and obsession with our LGBTQ brothers and sisters? There is a magic to minding your business. And I dream of a day where we spend less time judging and more time loving one another. Someone should do something about that. The night before his assassination, Dr. King delivered a speech in support of striking sanitation workers and said, let us stand tonight with a greater determination in these powerful days, these days of challenge to make America what it ought to be. Let's make her who she ought to be. Be bold enough to tell America when she's missed the mark and love America enough to embrace that boldness. Be strong in telling your story and your truth. At the same time, be courageous enough to let others tell their truth. We get so used to hearing one side of certain stories, what's real and what's true has become optional. A famous African proverb says, until the lions have historians, every, tory, every story told will glorify the hunter. Just once I'd like to hear the lion side, wouldn't you? Maybe the lion would tell us that being the fiercest, strongest in the jungle comes with a very high price tag. Perhaps he'd remind us that while lions do kill other lions, proximity, poverty, and despair are often the root cause. The lion would be able to share stories with us about the loving family he came from and the dreams they had for him and his future family. Maybe we could relate and find commonality and understanding with one another despite our obvious differences. Maybe we, maybe we would stop and ask ourselves, why are lions killed in record numbers every year? Perhaps it was his coveted majestic mane, his natural dominance in the jungle, his proud strut dripping with the confidence of his ancestors and generational adversities he's overcome, along with the glistening of his golden brown fur that in part led to his demise. The lion can't quite understand why this happens to so many of his brothers and sisters when they were just sleeping, or walking, or sitting, or running. The lion can't quite understand. The lion might ask if anyone truly cared about the mourning in the village because just being outraged is not enough. The lion might ask why some people assume he did something to provoke his death. The lion might ask, who is going to care for and protect my lioness and our children now? The lion would wonder, when will this ever stop? The lion would say, we should do something about that. So what time are we heading over there? Thank you. Thank you.